anyone ever had somebody come up to them and say, want to fight? I'm going to beat you up after school. Well, I have, and it scared the bejesus out of me. It was late in September 1986. I was in eighth grade. I had just acquired my first real boyfriend. His name was Darren. As you can see, he was pretty dreamy. He had, he had awesome hair, these beautiful blue eyes, a wicked smile, and he was really smart and funny. I thought I was pretty cool. Well, one day at the lunch table, because that's mostly where things happen in middle school, is at the lunch table, another classmate came up to me. Her name was Tiffany, and she said, you know Darren's mine, right? We're going to fight after school over him. Meet me under the bridge, and we're going to square off. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm four foot nothing. I have no idea how to fight. I don't have any brothers. I have five sisters, and I don't know what I'm going to do. I exited school that day, and I ran the whole mile and a half home. I holed up in my room. I had a, a can of cheese balls, and I contemplated my next move. I thought to myself, if I tell my parents, they're going to call the school. You see, my dad is an attorney. So I decided that was probably not my best move. So I decided that I had to handle this on my own. And in that moment, I decided I had to be the mayor of my own life. I had to make some choices about how I was going to self-advocate, how I was going to tell Tiffany, sorry, go pick on somebody else. So the next day, I waited before school to leave. I purposely took the long way to school. And when I got there, I didn't see her. I avoided all of the hot zones of any school any child will tell you about. The hallways, the locker rooms, the bathrooms, anywhere that Tiffany would be. Unfortunately, I had to go to lunch. She approached me once again at lunch with her throng of friends snickering and sneering and saying she wanted to beat me up again. I stood up and I said to her, I am not going to fight you. You need to find somebody else to pick on. She told me I was high and left, thankfully. For the rest of the year, and basically the rest of my life, I avoided Tiffany. We were in, we were in middle school together for one more year, and then we were at the high school. And I did see her, but I did avoid her. But in that moment, I knew that I had to define what dignity was for me. And at the base of what bullying, harassment, and intimidation is, is one human being trying to strip the dignity of another human being. It can be a child or it can be an adult. If we can teach our students to hold on to their voice, to advocate for each other and for themselves as they go through conflict, we are winning. Social justice guru Rosalind Wiseman defines dignity as one's inherent worth that no one has the right to take your voice away from you, that no one has the right to tell you how things are going to go. As I look at the dramatic shift that has happened with my students in the last 23 years of being on a secondary campus, I can tell you that our students are struggling. Some of them are crumbling under the tremendous academic pressure that we have started in kindergarten. I have four daughters of my own, ages 9, 9, 10, and 11. I still cannot do fifth grade math. <laughs> Many moms and dads have said to me in the last two or three months, what math is Ava going to take in sixth grade? Is she going to take regular math or honors math? And I think to myself, I don't know, but whatever she takes, I'm still not going to be able to do it. I have seen a dramatic shift in the locus of control becoming the adults. And I can tell you my theory as to why. In 2000, 2002, and 4, sweeping legislation came down from our state and our federal government saying, if bullying is going on, if harassment is going on, report, report, report to the adults in your life, the trusted adults at home, the trusted adults on campus. And so students do. They're really great in the role of the witness. And they report to us as parents, as well as trusted adults on campus. Unfortunately, systemically, this has set them up for a little bit of failure in that they don't know how 
to take care of small problems. They failed a paper. They lost their first boyfriend. They didn't make the team. The locus of control has become us as adults. They're constantly looking to us for the answers. I would encourage you, after hearing this tonight, that not only you allow them to have dignity in the process of the classes that they take, but also in their conflict. If we continue to intervene, the coping and resiliency skills of our students stay really, really low. And locally, we are seeing for sure that these coping and resiliency skills definitely need to rise. I am part of some Facebook groups. Recently, there was a thread with over 400 comments about whether or not a 12-year-old girl should be able to ride her bike to a friend's house. Now, this girl has a black belt in karate, she has a smartphone, and she knows this friend really well. Most of the parents that commented said no, no, and hell no when commenting on the thread. And so I, as an advocate, just said, can those of you that are commenting no tell me why? Predation, abduction, human trafficking, and sexual assault were all listed. Certainly those are things that we need to be aware of, and certainly as a prevention advocate, I want to make my own daughters and all of the students that I service aware of their surroundings. However, I cited that in the town of Gilbert, we have one of the lowest crime rates in the nation, so that our kids are pretty safe, and when given training to be aware, they're going to be okay if we allow them to take some risks. One parent asked, when should I give my student a smartphone? As the thread started having more comments, the median age was around 12 or 13 years old. So then that parent asked, well, when should I start or stop checking text messages and what's going on? And the median age, again, was 12 years old. I was absolutely flabbergasted by the same group of people saying, she can't leave the cul-de-sac but we will unleash her to the World Wide Web with no training and very little supervision. Something with that needs to change because at the school level, 90% of my job was fighting Facebook, Instagram, Snapchat, and Twitter. I have seen more images that are funny and more images that are tragic than I care to. And so when I give internet safety presentations, I often have parents come forward after privately and share with me that the crusade that I'm on is really important because they have been personally touched by something that has happened to their child. Recently, I spoke in Scottsdale and a mom came up to me with her daughter and said, I had no idea that a predator was luring and grooming my daughter for over two years on a laptop, in her room, with a webcam. And the only way that I was apprised of this information was the FBI and the City of Phoenix Police showed up on my doorstep. Recently, I was also speaking in Nashville, and I asked the audience, do you think our students are more or less resilient in 2018? And a teacher raised her hand, and she was smirking and sort of laughing, and she said, well, I'm kind of embarrassed to share this with you, but my son, who goes to Vanderbilt, who has a 4.2 grade point average, called one day when it was raining from Target, said, Mom, I really need your help. It's raining, and I need to know, should I buy a poncho or an umbrella? She hung up on her own son. <laughs> and what she said to our audience was, Dear God, what have I done? I'm a teacher, and I have carefully engineered his class schedule, his sports activities, even his college dorm application, to the point where it's raining and my child has no idea what to do. As I was having dinner the other night with a, a long lost dear friend, she asked what my TEDx talk was on, and I said, well, a little bit of bullying and harassment, a little bit of internet safety, a lot about coping and resilience. And she said, with her eyes really open wide, wow, I think you're describing me. And I said, why? And she said, I'm so embarrassed to tell you this, but I synced my email with my daughter's email last year as a college freshman, and every day I would check her email. 
and every day I would text her and remind her of her upcoming assignments and any social events that she needed to be reminded of. When I asked her, what was in it for you? Why do you think that you were doing that? She said, with tears in her eyes, I just want her to be the best Chloe she can be. And I looked at her and I said, I think she's doing pretty well. She landed an internship this summer in Los Angeles with Sony, and she has a 4.0 at one of the best universities in the country. One of the things that I also speak on is the trajectory of when coping and resilience isn't working. As a state, since 2009, our teen suicide rate has risen 85%. Locally, since May of 2017, just in Chandler, Gilbert, Mesa, and Queen Creek, we have lost 21 students to suicide. That is not because they're not great kids from great families with great resources, but some of their experiences are based on how they cope and how resilient they are. One of the things I'm really proud of is of the students that we've lost, we went to our state legislatures with Representative Sean Bowie and Mitzi Epstein, and we wrote the Mitchell Warnock Act, State Bill 1391, to get our teachers more training, our staff more training, our administrators more training on understanding what is the difference between typical teen angst and when someone's in an acute life crisis. That trajectory moves really quickly when we have tweens and teens that don't know where to go. One of the other things that some of the speakers tonight have alluded to is we show kids our front stage. And often, we forget to teach them on an ongoing and pervasive basis that we all have a backstage. These carefully curated photos and social media platforms really truly swallow our tweens and teens. As they scroll through, I'm not enough, I'm not skinny enough, I don't have that vacation, I don't have that scholarship, et cetera, et cetera. They really don't know all of the ingredients that go in to being a resilient and mature and socially competent, productive citizen. All they see in front of them is, I'm not measuring up. One of the things that I love about the I generation, which is what I affectionately call I gen, one in four Americans are I gen. They are super connected to each other with their devices that we have paid for, that we have given them. One of the things that we haven't given them is the training and supervision and management of the futuristic tool that it can be. One of the things that we do know about this generation, specifically today, is that millions of them are using this futuristic tool to march on Washington to ask for more appropriate gun control. So for all of the people that say that this generation is disengaged, uninvolved, lazy, unmotivated, unable to talk to a human being, I have to say that today, specifically, they are marching as mayors of their teenhood. And I can't applaud them anymore for that. There is hope for the iGen. One of the things that I talk mostly about is connection, vitamin C. C because the word connection starts with C, but C-S-E-E. -E because connection starts here, and here, and here. And one of the things that this revolutionary tool has given us is a way to communicate with each other. But true human connection is looking for three things. I want to be seen, I want to be heard, I want to be loved. And when kids specifically don't feel seen, heard, and loved, they will make sure that you know about it some way Somehow. At the school level, often my frequent flyers, the kids that I saw on a daily basis, were after one thing from me, a gain in relationship. If they couldn't get it at home and they couldn't get it in the classroom, I was the mean lady that would come get them and we'd have a one-on-one -on -one conversation. They got the connection they were looking for. 
There's an incredible video that I'd love for you to check out in your free time called The Still Face Experiment. One of my colleagues, Travis Webb, he's a local trauma therapist, turned me on to this video. And it's a mom and a baby who is strapped in a high chair. And a Harvard professor, Dr. Edward Tronick, asked the mom to play with her baby in a very natural way. They're pointing, they're giggling, they're laughing, she's tickling. And then the professor says, I'd like you to turn your back to the baby and turn back around and I would like you not to interact with your child. Immediately, the baby is frustrated. Immediately, she screams and writhes in her seat. These are our kids that are looking for that connection from us. What may look to you like unmotivated, lethargic, defiant, tantruming children are really human beings looking for that vitamin C. To take on the world, to take on the nation seems a little bit daunting to me, but I do know from my experiences, whether it was Tiffany who was trying to beat me up, or Darren who dumped me for a much more voluptuous classmate, that in between there, every training I do, every audience that I speak to, somewhere in between there, my, my resolve strengthens. And if we have the ability to just sprinkle a little bit of dust on our community, I know we can make a difference. You're probably wondering what happened to Darren. And this is not the part where we get back together, unfortunately. Um, but a few years after I graduated, I was driving down a dusty road. And there was Darren walking down the side of the road. And I thought, that's really weird. What is he doing walking down the side of the road? So I pulled over, he got in, we chatted. He shared with me that he had been struggling with drugs and alcohol. For Darren, the numbing agent of not getting the connection he needed in the way that he needed it was drugs and alcohol. I took him home, we had dinner. He stayed with me for a couple of days because his parents were really upset with him. And I didn't see him again. At the end of the story, unfortunately a year later, Darren died in a tragic car accident. And unfortunately for me, I didn't have an opportunity to say goodbye. But what I do have an opportunity to do is to carry his voice forward in that coping and resilience are not just a one and done assembly. They are a skill to be honed, to be practiced each and every day. Be the mayor of your town, our town, and every town. Thank you.